Thank you for joining me in worship today. My name is Teresa Pearson, and I serve as pastor at the Heron Riverview and Virgil United Methodist Churches. Let us start our time of worship with these words from Psalm 105. Give thanks to the Lord. Sing praise to God's name. The Lord has done wonderful things for us. The Lord has heaped blessing upon blessing in our lives. Come sing, shout, and give thanks to God. In all our ways, we will continually thank God forever. And now let us show our thanks as we join our voices in song. Let us sing that beloved hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. As we enter into a time of prayer today, I would especially like to lift up the family of Jackie Spillum. Jackie's daughter Heidi has passed away. Heidi grew up in this church and has since moved to California where her family currently resides. So not only do we want to lift our condolences and prayers of comfort for Jackie and family during this time, but we'd also like to offer prayers of traveling mercies for Jackie as well. Also on our prayer list, we would like to continue to lift up the family of Carol Johnson after George's sudden passing. We'd also like to lift up Lois Houck's brother, Cecil, who has had triple bypass surgery and is in a critical care home for care and therapy. We also continue to lift up these following names that have been on our list. Gerald Palmer, Kathy Hallman, George and Joni Legrand's nephew, Parker, Dale and Karen Carter and family. Jen Hoff Henke's granddaughter, Jody Gross. Lois Wood and Earl and Lynette Perryman. And today I know that we all come forward with other prayers of sorrow on our hearts, but also praises of joy. So let us take a moment to silently lift those things to the Lord. Lord, you know us all too well. You know how easy it is for us to come to you and to proclaim loudly of our faith when all is going well. But when the waters get rough and the waves threaten to swamp our little boats, we cry in fear. We are sure that these waves will be the very things that destroy us. Over the wind and the waves, you call to us to place our trust in you. 
That's not always so easy for us. We are so used to getting lots of reassurances and written guarantees for our safety. But still, still you call to us. Help us take our focus off the wind and the waves and place our gaze directly on you. Attune our hearts and our lives to hear your call and to respond in faith. For we offer this prayer in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to remind you that if you have anything that you would like your church family to be in prayer for you, you may certainly contact me directly or contact the office. In today's lectionary reading, we are continuing in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Jesus walks on the water. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshiped him saying, truly, you are the son of God. Here ends the reading of our Holy Gospel. Would you pray with me? Lord, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and redeemer. Amen. In the 1990s, people were obsessed with these things called magic eye pictures. Do you remember those? These audio stereograms allowed you to see a picture within a picture. Initially, the picture looks like a random pattern but apparently, as you focus your eyes, a second image becomes available. Now I say apparently because I am not able to see the magic eye pictures. And that's always frustrated me. You could get posters or books filled with these images with the tagline, a new way of looking at the world. Now I feel really disappointed that I can't see them. And I'm not alone. On her TV show, Ellen DeGeneres once admitted, Hi, my name is Ellen, and I can't magic eye. A couple of years ago, a picture of sneakers took the internet by storm, making the rounds on Facebook and other social media. What color are the shoes? Some people see gray and green, while others see pink and white. I usually see gray and green, but sometimes I do see pink and white. It changes for me, sometimes even during the same day. Now, isn't that amazing how we can look at something and see something different? Today, I'm inviting you to look at a familiar story with eyes open to a different perspective. This scripture picks up immediately where we left off last week, right after Jesus fed the 5,000. And if you were with us last week, we talked about how Jesus was looking for some time alone after hearing the news of the death of John the Baptist. But 
His time away was interrupted by a large crowd that had followed him to his chosen rest stop. However, he had compassion for the crowds, spent the day with the people, including the miracle of feeding well over 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. Today's reading picks up right after the disciples had gathered the 12 baskets of leftovers. Jesus tells the disciples to get in the boat and head to the other side of the lake where he will meet up with them later. After all, he knew that he still needed that alone time that he had been seeking. He went up the mountain to pray and to reconnect with the Father. Meanwhile, the disciples are bucking a strong head, headwind, battered by waves out in the middle of the lake. Now let's not confuse this with this scripture that happened earlier back in chapter eight, where the disciples feared for their lives as they were in the middle of a raging storm on the water while Jesus slept soundly in the boat. Different scripture, there's no storm here, just some wind and waves, so nobody is fearing for their lives. Well, at least not until they see what looks like a ghost walking on the water. The time is somewhere between 3 and 6 a.m. and Jesus is literally walking on the water to meet the disciples. By this point, the disciples have witnessed Jesus perform many miracles, but nothing quite like this. So they think they are seeing an apparition, a ghost on the lake, and they cry out in fear. But Jesus says, take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. In other words, he's saying, Hey guys, don't worry, it's just me. You don't have to be scared. So Peter says, if it's really you, call me to join you out on the water. And then we get to that familiar part of the story. Jesus tells him to come and Peter steps out of the boat and walks on the water. That is until he looks down at the waves, loses his nerve and starts to sink. He cries out and Jesus saves him immediately saying, you of little faith, why did you doubt? I've heard many sermons that boil this all down to a story about Peter's faith, commending him for having faith to step out of the safety of the boat. In fact, one of my favorite songs by Casting Crowns called The Voice of Truth tells the story in this way. Oh, what I would do to have the kind of faith it takes to climb out of this boat I'm in onto the crashing waves, to step out of my comfort zone into the realm of the unknown where Jesus is, and he's holding out his hand. But the waves are calling out my name and they laugh at me, reminding me of all the times I've tried before and failed. The waves, they keep on telling me time and time again, boy, you'll never win, you'll never win. But the voice of truth tells me a different story. The voice of truth says, do not be afraid. The voice of truth says, this is for my glory. Out of all the voices calling out to me, I will choose to listen and believe the voice of truth. Aren't those great lyrics? We should all have faith to trust in Jesus to step out of the boat, right? The point is to be courageous and step out of the boat, but to keep our eyes, our focus on Jesus. It's a good solid message. And like I said earlier, it's a sermon message that I've heard many times before. But I wonder, I wonder if there's more we can learn from this story. Sometimes I think we can get too comfortable in the narrative we think we know, and we don't take the opportunity to look at scripture with fresh eyes. At the start of this week, I was preparing to preach a message largely based on those lyrics that I just shared, challenging us each to have faith like Peter and step out of the boat. But as I began picking apart the scripture, studying each line, you know, instead of just glossing through this story that I've heard a million times before that I know so well already, a question hit me hard. Why did Peter get out of the boat in the first place? Let's look back at the scripture. The disciples see what they think is a ghost. Jesus says, don't worry, it's me. Do not be afraid. 
And then in verse 28, Peter says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Wait a minute, if it's you? It's like Peter is saying, can I see some identification, please? What do we do when someone asks us that question? Can I see some ID, please? We get asked to show our ID all the time in the checkout line, during a traffic stop, when we are signing official documents, if our age is in question and we wanna purchase alcohol, or on the flip side, order something from the senior menu, we are asked to provide identification often. And so we usually whip out our wallets and show our driver's license. But let's say that you go to the same restaurant all the time and you eat dinner there every night for weeks. You become a regular and everybody knows your name. Does the server continue to ask for your ID every time to check your age? Of course not. Peter doesn't just kind of know Jesus in passing. He dropped his fishing nets and gave up everything to follow Jesus and become one of his disciples, even part of the inner circle. That's pretty close. And now Peter is asking Jesus for his ID? What? Okay, well, I understand that this is a unique situation and I would be pretty freaked out if I saw someone walking on the water too. But Jesus says, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Why isn't that enough for Peter? Why does Peter test Jesus by saying, if it is you, call me out to come on the water with you. When Peter starts to sink, and calls out to Jesus, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reaches out to save him and says, you of little faith, why did you doubt? I've always assumed that Jesus' question to Peter was more about Peter's faith in Jesus, giving him the ability to walk on the water. I told you to come meet me on the water. Why would you doubt that I would protect you and enable you to do this? But what if Jesus' real question is, why did you doubt when I identified myself and told you to not be afraid? Hey, buddy, I told you it was me. Why didn't you believe me? Why do we doubt? Is it simply part of our human nature? Why do we feel the need to test Jesus and to make him prove himself to us? Often when people pray, they ask for signs. Lord, if it's really you, if you're really there listening to me, then show me a sign. Have you ever done that? Thankfully, Jesus is always there for us. Even when we have those moments when our faith wavers, when we let our doubts rise to the surface. Even though Peter had doubts, Jesus reached out his hand immediately and saved Peter when he called out. Jesus always shows up. Maybe the takeaway from a different perspective today is that Jesus is always there, even when we think it's not possible. Jesus was on the lake with the disciples, even though they thought it was impossible. After all, they had left him on the shore, and yet here he was in the middle of the churning lake during the darkest time of night saying, it's me. Don't be afraid. I am with you. I don't know if you see the gray and green shoes or the pink and white shoes, but I do know that from either perspective, they're still shoes. No matter how you look at it, this is a story about faith. Faith that Jesus will be with us when we step out of the boat. Faith that Jesus will calm the waves of doubt. Faith that Jesus is always there, offering his hand to all who will reach for it. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you for being right there beside us, even when we doubt your presence. We know we do not deserve your grace that you have so freely poured out on us. And yet you are there with us in the middle of the raging sea, in the middle of our darkest night. Help us to remember that you are always there, even when we think it's impossible. Strengthen our faith 
and remind us that all things are possible through you. Amen. And now I'd invite you to join in song one more time as we sing Blessed Assurance. Receive this benediction. Let us go forth in faith, confident in God's grace that is with us in the calm and in the storm. Go in peace, sharing that peace with others. Amen.